Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus. And as always, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now, in today's part 4, we will introduce the so-called partial derivatives. Indeed, these are the simplest derivatives we have in multivariable calculus because they immediately come from the one-dimensional case. Therefore, we start with them here and I would say this is not a hard topic today. However, maybe for the start, let's recall that in the last video we have defined functions on the plane. And there we have seen that the continuity property covers all possible directions we can choose in the plane. For example, being continuous at the origin means we can choose a sequence on the x1 axis that converges to zero or a sequence on the x2 axis and indeed every other sequence that converges to the origin. And all these sequences need to have the property that the corresponding sequence of the images converges to the value at the origin. Therefore, it makes sense that for a derivative, we also have to consider all such possible approximations. In fact, if we just consider the axis, then we get out the partial derivatives. Okay, now here it makes sense that I tell you that for the value of the function we have different notations. Indeed, the common one, the usual one, would be that we write f of x for the value at the point x. And of course, x comes from the domain, so it's a vector with two components. Therefore, another also correct notation would be to put this vector into the function. So obviously, this is the same thing, but here we explicitly write the components. However, most of the time it's not very suitable to write it in this column form and therefore we have another notation as well. There we just put the components as independent variables into the function. Okay, so formally you see some differences here, but in the end they all represent the same function. And then just depending on the problem, we choose the most suitable one. In fact, if we consider partial derivatives, this notation here is the most used one. Moreover, one simplification we can immediately do here is that we fix one coordinate. For example, we can say that we choose a real number x2 and put this into the function. And then what remains is just a function with one real variable x1. So more precisely, we map x1 to the value f of x1, x2. And then you should see, this is just an ordinary function from r to r. And maybe to make the whole thing here more clear, let's call the fixed value x2, x2 tilde. Okay, and then you should see, because we have an ordinary function, the question about the derivative makes immediately sense. It's simply the ordinary notion of differentiability we have learned in real analysis. Therefore, let's put the whole idea into a formal definition. And of course, we can immediately generalize that to functions in Rn. And then what we will define are the so-called partial derivatives. Or more precisely, we will talk about the notion that the function is partially differentiable with respect to one variable. And maybe let's choose the first one, the variable x1. Moreover, you know differentiability is a pointwise property, so we have to fix the point as well. And maybe, as before, let's call the point simply x tilde. So you know we have a vector with n components. And maybe you might already know how the definition should look like. It should simply be the differential quotient of this ordinary one-dimensional function. This means we look at the difference of f at x1 tilde plus h minus f of x1 tilde. And of course we know all the other variables should be fixed. Hence there is no h involved there. Ok, so we have this difference here, the difference in the value. And then, as usual, we have to divide this by the difference of the input. Which of course is simply h. And then, when we send h to 0 and if this limit exists, we have our derivative. 
So in summary, if this ordinary differentiable quotient where all the other variables are fixed exists, then we call f partially differentiable with respect to the given variable x1. Moreover, there you should see, it's no problem at all to write down this definition for all the other variables, like x2, x3 and so on. For this reason, I don't want to do it here explicitly, but rather talk about different notations we have for this differential quotient here. And indeed, in the literature you find many different ones. And I would say, the most common one is the one with these curved d's. And most of the time one just says df dx1. But also you hear it as partial df and partial dx1. However, I should say, it's important that you don't forget the point x tilde in the notation. So either you write just x tilde or all the components. And then you should see this x1 here just tells us at which component we form the partial derivative. So in other words, this is a real number that comes out of this limit and it is called the partial derivative of f with respect to x1 at the point x tilde. Moreover, as I said before, there are also a lot of other notations one uses for this number. So for example, you often see the partial d with x1 in the index. And also there, you shouldn't forget about the point you put in. Then in the same sense, one also uses a capital D instead of the partial D. So that's also possible to say that we have a derivative with respect to x1. And indeed, there's even a shorter notation one uses when there is no confusion, we put the index x1 directly to the function f. Okay, and with this I would say, these are the most common notations for the partial derivative. However, if you search for it, you still find other ones as well. Now, for closing this definition, I should at least tell you how the definition looks like for the partial derivative with respect to x2. So again, it's the limit, it's the differential quotient where we have f of x1 tilde, x2 tilde and so on, minus the same thing. But in the first term we have plus h at the second position. But not at the other positions. And then, of course, we just divide this by h again. Okay, so this is all and now I really think you don't have any problems writing down the same thing for x3. In other words, now we have defined all possible partial derivatives. Therefore, the last thing we can do here in this video is to look at examples. And maybe let's look at an example from R3 into R. And the function here should be given by f of x1, x2, x3 is equal to x1 squared times x2 times the sine of x3. Now, obviously, this is a well-defined function and I can ask you, is it partially differentiable with respect to x1? Indeed, we see this is true and it works no matter which position x tilde we choose. Simply because the one-dimensional function x1 squared we consider now is very simple. And here, please recall, with respect to the partial derivative, the two factors here, x2 and sine of x3, are just constants. Hence, our partial derivative here is 2 times x1 times the constant. And then we put in the point x tilde, so all the components get tildes now. So you see, this is not so complicated and for this reason often you see that one chooses x1, x2, x3 for the point one puts in, so without a tilde. However, in order to sensitize you, I go with the tildes now. So in summary, we have that f is partially differentiable with respect to x1 for all points x tilde and therefore the partial derivative here gives us a new function. And obviously we can just call this new function partial df, partial dx1 and it is defined on R3. So you see, this works like in the one dimensional case where the derivative can give us a new function we can calculate with. Okay, then for the rest of the video, let's consider the partial derivatives with respect to x2 and x3. Mm -hmm. 
Now, with respect to x2, you see we have a linear function where the constant is x1 squared times sine x3. And there of course you know the derivative is just this constant then. However, because we put in x tilde as the point, we have tildes above the components as before. So you see, the whole thing here is not complicated at all if you already know how to calculate ordinary derivatives. Okay, and then the last thing I want to show you today is the partial derivative of f with respect to x3. And there you see, we just have the cosine of x3. Okay, and there you see, all the other components stay as constants in front. There, it might be a good point talking about constants. So a good question would be, what would change if we add here for the original function x3? So now we have a different function and obviously for the partial derivative with respect to x3, we have plus one here. However, all the other partial derivatives will not change because x3 is just a constant for x1 and x2. Namely, by taking the derivative, the constant will vanish. Hence, when you calculate a lot of things, this is something you have to keep in mind. Okay, so now you know what partial derivatives are. And then let's go to the next video where we talk about other derivatives. Therefore, I really hope that I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.